Okay, hello everybody. Uh, this is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. Tonight I'm continuing in the study of the book of John. And I'm going to pick up where I left off last time, beginning with uh, John chapter 13, verse 1. Now, if you have not seen the previous studies on John, uh, they're all uploaded on my YouTube channel, Sin City Preacher. I really hope you go back and watch this from the beginning. I believe John is the most important book in the entire Bible, and uh, so it deserves your careful attention and start with John chapter 1, verse 1. Okay, I'm a KJV firstist, so I'll look at it in the KJV first. And then I'll also uh, probably look at it in the amplified version because it amplifies it. And, it, and sometimes I find that to be helpful. Okay. John chapter 13, verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour w was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. Hmm. Okay, look at it in the Amplified and see how it states it. Uh, now, before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his hour had come and it was time for him to leave this world and return to the Father. Having greatly loved his own who were in the world, he loved them and continuously loves them with his perfect love to the end, eternally. All right, so it's Passover. Uh, Jesus uh, knows that uh, uh, the, the end of his uh, life and ministry is uh, coming. Uh, he, he knows the future. He knows about his death, burial, and resurrection. And he's even told the apostles about it uh, numerous times. Uh, and he even told the Jews that he would give them a sign that uh, he, he, there would be a death, burial, and resurrection as proof that his claims were true. And it says that uh, he'll be returning to the Father, and but he loves all of all of those in the world that uh, he came, came to die for and, and save. Verse 2 in the KJV says, And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he was come from God and went to God, he riseth from supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. So that's verse 2, 3, and 4, but let's back up to verse 2. And supper being ended, the devil, having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot to betray him. So this is telling us that, that, that the devil is putting this into Judas' heart. Uh, let me look at that in the Amplified. It was during supper when the devil had already put the thought of betraying Jesus into the heart of Judas Iscariot. There is a verse coming up, I believe, where the the devil uh, in, uh, indwells Jesus. He's uh, possessed by the devil, I believe. But this is not the one. This is just the devil giving Judas the idea to uh, betray Jesus. In verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, so the Father had given all things into Jesus' hands, and that he was come from God, Jesus had come from God, come out of God uh, and and he and went to God uh, so I, when it says and went to God it seems to be that's past tense so let's see how that's expressed in the Amplified um, Simon's son uh, Jews, it, it was during supper when the devil had already put the thought of betraying Jesus into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, that Jesus, knowing that the Father had put everything into his hands, and that he had come from God and was now returning to God. Uh, so it says here in the Amplified, and now, 
returning to God. So he knows that this is about to happen. It's Passover. This is the time when he would be uh, crucified. Uh, so the KJV says, and went to God. It's past tense. So I don't think that's the best way of expressing it because obviously Jesus is there in the present tense. He has not left to go be with God the Father yet. Uh, verse 4 says, He riseth from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself. Verse 5, After that he poureth water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Um, from what I understand, uh, it was customary for uh, when you entered someone's home, uh, people wearing sandals uh, as, to, as, the, as the norm, uh, and it would, could be dusty, and your feet were always dirty. So you enter someone's home, you would take off your sandals, and a servant in the house would wash the feet of the guests. It wasn't the, the master of the house that did this kind of a thing, it was a servant. Uh, so, to have uh, your feet washed when you come to someone's home, th this is not uncommon, but to have the master wash your feet, that would be just unheard of. Uh, so, he says, then, then, he, then cometh he to Simon Peter. Let me read the first five in the Amplified verse, though. See how it expresses it. He then poured water into the basin, and began washing the disciples' feet and wiping them with the towel which was tied around his waist. Okay, no insights there, but uh, verse 6 in the KJV, Then cometh he to Simon Peter, and Peter saith unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. Simon Peter saith unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So, uh, Simon, as is typical with him, uh, he it, it, he says, writes on his mind, and sometimes it's uh, it's um, it's absolutely the wrong thing. Uh, like you're not ever going to wash my feet, or or that uh, uh, I will uh, take up a sword and defend you. I'll die with you when if, if when the time comes. And, and uh, uh, or Jesus answered the asked the apostles who came back from. Um, uh, preaching the gospel about Jesus, and he came back to Jesus and asked them, who do you, the people say that I am? And he said to them, who do you say that I am? Peter was the one that spoke up. Peter was the one that said, Lord, can I come out to you on the boat? And and he walked on the water. He was always the very first to in, uh, insert himself. He was very um, um, uh, assertive. And, and a leader in that respect, he he didn't wait to follow the crowd. He was he would initiate everything, and and in this case, he's the one only one that's recorded here that tells Jesus, no, you can't wash my feet. <laughs> uh, and then Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you can't have any part with me. You can't be any. I won't have anything to do with you if you don't don't allow me to wash your feet. So Peter, as usual, he. He says something really, really, uh, I want to say extreme, but a very, um, uh, he totally reverses his position. So not only can you now wash my feet, but you can wash my hands and my head, for that, but I don't want to lose my relationship with you. And so we go to look at uh, verse 10. Well, let me look at the verse um, 8 and 9 in the Amplified. Peter said to him, You will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. We can have nothing to do with each other. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, in that case, wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Now, verse 10 in the KJV says, And Jesus saith to him, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And ye are clean, but not all. Uh, I'm not sure I'm following that in the KJV. Let me read it again. Jesus saith to him, that's Peter, He that is washed needeth not save to wash his feet but is, is clean every whit, and ye are clean. So he's saying Peter and the others are clean, but not all. There's an exception. We know that, that he's speaking of Judas here. Let me read it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 10 says, Jesus said to him, Anyone who has bathed needs only to wash his feet and is completely clean. Anyone who has bathed needs only to wash his feet. I don't understand that. If you bathe, aren't you submerging your whole body in the bathtub? Uh, why would you need to wash your feet after you bathe? Uh, but maybe it's just, uh, you know, uh, semantics, the way it's, uh, it's expressed. But I'm confused. Anyone who has bathed needs only to wash his feet and is completely clean. And you, my disciples, are clean, but not all of you. Verse 11 in the KJV says, For he knew who should betray him. Therefore said he, Ye are not all clean. Uh, verse 12. So after he had washed their feet and had taken his garments and was set down again, he said unto them, Know ye what I have done to you? Ye call me master and lord, and ye say, Well, for so I am. So, uh, let me see in verse 13 how that says, Master and Lord. You call me teacher and Lord, um, and you are right in doing so. I don't know if that uh, Lord is in the case of kurios, and the Lord, Lord which means God. Uh, I'd have to look that up. I don't want to go there right now, but... But normally when we see Jesus referred to as Lord, it's not Lord as, as the Lordship salvationists want to uh, define it today. As in, uh, you're the Lord of my life. You're in control. I will obey and serve you completely. I'm your servant. I'm your slave. My, I turn my will over to you. You're in charge of my life. That's what a Lordship salvationist would say uh, Lord means. But um, I, I don't know if there's the translation in this particular verse without going and looking it up. But normally Lord is translated from the word in Greek, kurios. And that does not mean you're, I'm your master. And uh, in fact, this would be kind of redundant if he says, if he says here, um, you call me master and Lord. So master would be, um, would have the meaning as in lordship salvation, that he's my master, I'm serving him. Uh, but here it says master and lord, so it gives me the impression that it's, it, there's two different thoughts imparted here, not one thought that's repeated. Not, otherwise, you could, it's like saying, you call me master and master. No, it's you call me master and God. Because Kurios is trend, is, means God, not just uh, Lord, simply Lord. Um, so he says, um, Ye call me Master and Lord, and ye say, Well, so he, Jesus is accepting the title of Master and Lord. He says, For so I am. He always accepts their, their praise, their worship, their uh, recognition, and and uh, you know, the, the, the names that are reserved only for God, but he accepts them. Uh, verse 15, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. He washed their feet as an example to, to teach them a lesson. Uh, he humbled himself 
Here he is greater than them. He created the whole universe. He created them. He he is uh, came to die for their sins, and he's going to raise himself from the dead, showing his power over life and death. And yet he's uh, willingly making himself into a servant as an example for them and for us. Um, verse 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord. Now this is Lord with a, um, a lowercase l. So this could be translated, the servant is not greater than his master. Okay. In the previous verse, when it in verse 13 it says, Ye call me master and Lord. The Lord is capitalized, and that indicates that it's a Lord in, um, to be translated as God. So I would say that that must be the word uh, in Greek. It must be kurios. Um, so verse uh, 16, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. So he's referencing uh, God, fa Father God as the one that sent, and the Son, Son of God, uh, God the Son, being the one who was sent. He says the one that sent is not greater than the one that sends. And, and, the, uh, and, and also it could be said that the servant is not greater than his master or his Lord. I want to see it written in the Amplified, uh, verse 15 and 16. For I gave you this as an example so that you should do in turn as I did to you. Serve each other. Humble yourself. What, what could be more humbling than washing someone's feet? And this is one of the reasons I admire the medical profession so much. In, in 2014, I... I had a very hard year with my health. Uh, I was in and out of the hospitals all year and multiple surgeries and, and months of, of uh, nurses coming to my home. And I developed a great admiration and, and uh, appreciation for uh, nurses and, and doctors and the health care professionals. Uh, they, they are like this. They're serving and, and some, of the, some of the ways, things that they do for others is is uh, i mean bedpans you know cha changing diapers on people washing them and doing all these things that are some people would feel it consider it to be a humiliating thing to do uh, and and yet they are servants willing to do this for for the health of others and he gave us as an example and this is to illustrate to look here he is the creator of all things humbling himself, washing his disciples' feet to show us that uh, if he's willing to uh, be a servant, if he's willing to uh, lower himself to that, we should all be willing to, to, to serve each other. Um, uh, verse, let's look at this in the Amplified. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, a slave is not greater than his master, uh, nor is one who is sent greater than the one who sent him. And verse 17 in the KJV says, If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Uh, sometimes the word blessed is used, and, and, and blessed and happy are, uh, in the Bible basically means the same thing. Uh, uh, in the Beatitudes, and, uh, blessed are ye who... Blessed are you, it means happy are you, you're happy. Your life will be happy if you do these things. Um, in verse uh, 18, I speak not of you all. I know whom I have chosen, but that the scripture may be fulfilled. He that eateth bread with me hath lifted up his heel against me. So he's alluding here without naming him, Judas, who would betray him. Verse 19, Now I tell you before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Now, ye may believe that I am he. Repeatedly, Jesus says this uh, in that way, 
And the term I am is a title for, for God. And it's never to be used casually in any other way. And yet he says, you may believe that I am he. And he also says that if you believe, do not believe that I am he, you shall die in your sins. Because the, the Jews, for the most part, did not believe his claims. He said he came down from heaven. He, he, he says he is the son of God. Uh, he, he says he is uh, uh, he and the father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the father. Well, he says, I am he, uh, a title for God. So all these times he's uh, claim, making these claims of deity. Uh, and he says, now I tell you before come. So he's doing a prophecy about being betrayed. So that when it happens, they'll recall, yeah, he told us in advance he was going to be betrayed. And this is another sign of him uh, being able to uh, tell us what's going to happen in the future, which is uh, an attribute of God. Uh, now I tell you before it come, that when it come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send, receiveth me. And he that receiveth me, receiveth him that sent me. So he's talking about sending them out as, uh, in their work, for in their ministry, that when they go out, if people accept them, then it's like they receive them. It's like receiving Jesus because they're representing him. They're ambassadors for him. Let's look at this portion in the Amplified, verse 19 and 20. From now on, I am telling you what will happen before it occurs so that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he who I say I am, the Christ, the anointed, the Messiah. I assure you and most solemnly say to you, the one who receives and welcomes whomever I send receives me, and the one who receives me receives him who sent me in that, in that same way. So he says, I'm going to send you out. The people who receive you are receiving me and also receiving Father. Verse 21 in the KJV says, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Uh, now, there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Uh, this is, uh, we, we know from putting other parts of scripture together that this is a reference to John, the writer of the book of John. It says, now there was one leading on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. He loved all of them, but there was a special love for, for John. And uh, it's, it's said numerous times that John is the beloved apostle. Why would he love him more than the others? Is it right for God to love one person more than another? Uh, well, uh, I, the thing that I can see that is uh, distinct with John is that uh, when Jesus was arrested and crucified, every apostle uh, left him. They, they would, did not go to the trial. They did not go to the cross uh, and, and stand by him as he suffered and died. Only John. So John was the only truly faithful apostle and uh, maybe that, that's certainly distinctive to me. Maybe that's distinctive to Jesus. And that Jesus, knowing that in advance, he always had a special place for John in his heart. Um, let me read that portion in the Amplified. Um, verse 21. After Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, one of you will betray me and hand me over. The disciples began looking at one another, puzzled and disturbed as to whom uh, he could mean. So he says, one of you is going to betray me. So they're all looking, wondering. And uh, it says, one of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, esteemed, was leaning against Jesus' chest. That's John. Verse 24 in the KJV says, Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him. 
that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. So John is leaning on Jesus' shoulder, and Peter, maybe sitting next to John, tells John, ask him, ask him the name of the person who's going to betray him. Uh, he then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto to him, Lord, this is John speaking, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is whom, to whom I shall give a sop uh, when I have dipped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. So I think the sop is a piece of bread and that they, they would dip it. It's kind of like maybe dipping chips into salsa or something to, to add flavor. And let me see. Let me read that portion of the Amplified. Uh, verse 24. So Simon Peter motioned to John and quietly asked him, ask him to ask Jesus to whom he was speaking. Then leaning back against Jesus' chest, he, John, asked him privately, Lord, who is it? And Jesus answered, It is the one to whom I am going to give this piece of bread after I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the piece of bread into the dish, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. So now at least John and Peter are aware that Judas is the one Jesus identified as a traitor. Verse 27 in the KJV, and after the sop, Satan entered into him. So, you see, earlier it says that Satan whispered in his ear, put the thought in his mind, betray Jesus. And now, at this point, Satan enters into him. He apparently is possessed by Satan. He's not just possessed by a demon or possessed by a legion of demons. He's possessed by Satan himself. Um, after the soft, Satan entered into him. Then said Jesus unto him, That thou doest, do quickly. And let's look at 26 and 27 in the Amplified. So when he had dipped the piece of bread into the dish, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. Uh, after Judas had taken the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you are going to do, do quickly without delay. So he said, he said that Jesus was aware of it. He told him to do it. And some people have theories, even there's even a, uh, these uh, non-canonical books uh, that are written. I don't know if it's the, the Gospel of Judas or the Gospel of, uh, um, I don't know. There's a, I haven't read these books that are not accepted in the, as canon. They're accepted as inspired books in the Bible. But I've, I've heard a lot about them from other teachers and from the History Channel and things like that. And it, um, the uh, let me see oh yes yeah, so the, 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 there's a, a teaching in some of these books that Judas is not a horrible person that betrayed Jesus but, but Judas is really the most loved the, the greatest of the apostles of course, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Jesus says here. But um, others teach that no, Judas was the greatest because he he went on a mission and did this at Jesus's wishes. He wouldn't have done it except that Jesus, uh, he and he had private talks and discussed this. It was part of the plan. He must be betrayed, and and uh, of course, Jesus didn't have to be betrayed at all. Jesus could have just gone out in public and, and the, uh, 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 you know, the, the Jews, the, the Sanhedrin, that they, they could have just taken him in public or they could have, he could have, it could have been done so many ways without the need for Judas to betray him. So why, why did 
was it necessary for Jesus to betray him? Because it was written. It was written in the, in the Old Testament books that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. And that, so this had to happen because once it is written in the Bible, that means it's going to happen. It's a certainty in the future. That's the way it will play out. Uh, but there's nothing in the Bible that indicates Jesus, that Judas was uh, cooperating with Jesus and that uh, Judas is uh, really the favorite apostle. No, on the contrary, it says that he's doing the work of Satan. Um, now, in the back of the KJV, um, verse 28, Now no man at the table knew for what intent he spake this unto him, for some of them thought, because Judas had the bag, that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that we have need of against the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So when Judas got up and departed, and Jesus said, go do what you need to do, it, do it quickly, uh, they didn't understand. I think that uh, perhaps John and Peter at this point did understand, but as a whole, the apostles didn't know that Judas was being uh, released to go betray him. Let's see how it stated in the Amplified. Uh, some thought that since Judas, as the treasurer of the group, had the money bag box, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he was to give something to the poor. Okay, verse 30 in the KJV says, He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. Therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. Uh, well, when we think of glorified, uh, we think of a, a resurrected, glorified body. Well, of course, the resurrection hasn't happened, but... I think this is meaning that now the plan is in, in play. Everything is, is proceeding as planned. Let's see how it states it in the Amplified. Uh, verse 31. So when Judas had left, Jesus said, Now is the time for the Son of Man to be glorified. Yes. So that's, that's uh, stating it more clearly for us. And God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him, the Son, in himself, and will glorify him at once. Okay, I've gone on in the Amplified farther than I intended. Let's go back to KJV. And it says, verse 32, If God be glorified in him, in Jesus, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, so now I say to you. Uh, so he's saying he's, he's little children, identify them as uh, he could, because he loves them. He, he, treat, he, he looks at them as, as his little children. Um, in the Amplified, it states, it's um, verse 32, If God had glorified in him, God will also glorify him, the Son, in himself, and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I told the Jews, so I tell you now, where I am going, you are not able to come. So he's going to the cross, he's going into the tomb. Verse 34 in the KJV. A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Now, I think it's this point of being important to explain the difference in the word disciple and believer. 
Uh, a believer is someone who has put their faith in Jesus for their salvation and received uh, salvation as a free gift. Uh, a disciple is not necessarily a believer. Uh, early, many times, Judas was referred to as a disciple. A disciple is a student, a follower, uh, someone who sits there and learns from them, someone who serves them and, and assists them. Uh, these are things that disciples do. But a disciple is not necessarily a believer. Judas is an example. Um, the other apostles were disciples and also believers. Um, and then there are people who are believers and not disciples. They believe in Jesus, they get saved, they're guaranteed they're going to go to heaven, and yet they're not necessarily, uh, you know, studying and, and serving and, and working in ministry and uh, um, doing all those things. But they're, they're not uh, mutually exclusive. You can be a believer and a disciple, but you can also be a believer who's not a disciple, and you can be a disciple who's not a saved believer. Uh, but let me read this portion in the Amplified. Uh, I am, verse 34, I am giving you a new commandment that you love one another just as I have loved you. How did he love us? He loved us so much he was willing to die for us. So you are too, so you too are to love one another. Now by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. This is loving each other is not the way that we prove that we are uh, Christians, uh, are saved, or believers in Jesus. Uh, that's not an indicator or proof necessarily. There are some people who are saved that are not very good at loving. And there are some people that are very good at loving, but they're, they're not saved. They never put their complete faith in Jesus. But as a disciple, some, he says, as my disciples, this will be a, a, the way that you, you are identified, that you love each other. Um, if you have love and that selfish concern for one another. Verse 36 in the KJV. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, whither thou goest, wh whither goest thou? Jesus answered him, whither I go, thou canst not follow me now, but thou shalt follow me afterwards. Peter said unto him, Lord, why can't I... Cannot I follow thee now? I will lay down my life for thy sake. See, there he is, very boldly making these outlandish, um, you know, statements, uh, and not realizing that that uh, some of the things that uh, he, he he's so anxious to 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 step forward, uh, be the first, be the leader to make it, to to say you are the Christ, the Son of the Son of God. Uh, that's who you are, to uh, say, uh, you'll never wash my feet. Uh, and as he says here, uh, I, I will lay down my life for thy sake. He, he makes these really bold statements. That's just his personality. But verse 38, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down my life? Wilt, wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall crow till thou hast denied me thrice. The cock shall not crow. I think in other versions and other other um, gospel accounts, it says the cock shall uh, crow thr thrice uh, before you deny me. Or I, I'm not sure how it's if it's stated differently in other in other gospel accounts, but uh, here it says. The cock shall not crow. So the cock is not going to crow at all. Before the cock crows, you will deny me three times, he's saying. Let's read this in the Amplified. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, where are you going? Jesus answered, where I am going, you cannot follow me now, but you will be able to follow later. Uh, well, he's following him into to death, unto the cross. Um, tradition says that Peter was also crucified. And it says that he said, not like this, uh, I'm not worthy to be crucified in the same way as Jesus, my Lord and Savior. And so they crucified him upside down, so it would not be the same. 
But tradition says that Peter was crucified. And so Jesus is saying he'll follow him to this death, into death later. Peter said to him, Lord, why can I, why cannot I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? I assure you and most solemnly say to you, before a rooster crows, you will deny me and completely disown me three times. At the end of chapter 13. Now, I've noticed that uh, at the beginning of this chapter, it talks about having supper. Now, this is what we refer to as the Last Supper in, uh, in the upper room and uh, the, the Passover meal. Uh, this customary uh, in, in the other accounts it goes into more detail about the actual ceremony when Jesus says this is he takes the bread and says this is my body and shows the wine this is my blood this is not explained in any detail in this gospel account with John um, so let me there are some footnotes here let me see what it says here John thirteen twenty one. John 13, 23. Let me see what that says. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And it says here, probably John the Apostle, author of this gospel and brother of James the Apostle, the mother of John and James was Salome, who is believed to be the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Wow. I didn't know, know that. The mother of John and James was Salome, who is believed to be the sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Wow, they're related. So that would make them, let me see, uh, their mother is the sister. Mother of John and James was Salome, who is believed to be the sister of Mary. So uh, they would be cousins. John and James would be Jesus' cousin in this case, if this is so. If so, Jesus and the brothers, oh, it says here, <laughs> if so, Jesus and the brothers were related as cousins. Well, I had never heard that before. Um, as with customary, in ancient times, everyone at the meal was reclining on his side on a long dining couch or bench when there was a pause during the meal for discussion. It was common among close friends for one to lean back on the chest or shoulder of the other. So that's describing how John was leading on, laying on the breast of Jesus. Um, and now verse 1329 says, uh, for some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus had said unto him, buy those things that thou have need of against the feast or that he should give something to the poor. And the footnote here says, uh, Passover was considered a special time for charitable gifts to the poor. Uh, verse 32, there's a footnote. It says, if God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself and shall straightway glorify him. Uh, and this says, most early MSS do not contain this phrase. Okay, so you would not find that in the the other manuscripts that we get most of the other modern translations like NIV, NASV, and so on. Uh, verse 13:34. there's a footnote. It says, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. And uh, it says, The key to understanding this and for and other statements about love is to know that this love the Greek word agape is not so much a matter of emotion as it is of doing things for the benefit of another person. That is, having an unselfish concern for another and a willingness to seek the best for another. So that's love, I guess, as a verb or showed by, demonstrated by your actions. All right, so that's the end of chapter 13. Uh, the end of chapter 14, verse 1, next time. But for now, let me 
let me end uh, with a, an invitation for to receive the free gift of salvation. If you've watched uh, these uh, broadcasts before, you know that it's my custom at the end of every broadcast to tell you the good news. The good news that uh, if you want to have eternal life in heaven, if you want to go to heaven, it's offered to you as a free gift from Jesus. That's what the word gospel means, free gift. I mean, I'm sorry, good news. The good news is that salvation is a free gift. Now, if this is foreign to you, if this is news to you, if it sounds bizarre and uh, different to you, uh, it's because most people in the world uh, and most even churches are teaching that and going to heaven is a reward for your good behavior and that, that uh, heaven is uh, earned through personal merit. If you do a lot of good things and you abstain from bad th things and you can build up kind of a balance scale, a lot of good in your life, and there are very little sin or bad things, maybe God will look at the scale and say, okay, you, you've qualified, you get to go to heaven. That's the philosophy of the world and Sadly, that's what's even taught in many churches. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says that going to heaven is not a reward for good behavior. It's a gift we receive from Jesus because of our faith in him. That's what we call biblical Christianity. That's the Christianity that we find in the Bible. So I'm just want you now to reject any other way of getting to heaven. Do not believe that that uh, if you're a good enough person, you get to go to heaven. Reject that, because the Bible says that's impossible. Oh, the jet plane flying by is shaking up my whole house here. Um, so the world thinks that we work our way to heaven through religious works, good behavior. If we behave well, we, we go to heaven. But the Bible says, no, if we believe, we go to heaven, not behave. Uh, so put your faith in Jesus and receive the gift of eternal life. Jesus is eternal God Almighty who came down from heaven and became a man in order to die for our sins on the cross. He was buried and he was raised from the dead bodily on the third day. And this bodily resurrection is attested to in the Bible. He walked for 40 days among 500 witnesses. They saw him, they talked to him, they touched him, they ate with him. And it's the resurrection that Jesus promised would be a sign to prove his claims were true. He is God. He is the Savior. Put your faith in him now, and you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven because you've trusted the Savior. Thank you for watching. And bless you in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.